I've been chomping at the bit for a while to do a, you know, a little piece on California hockey. I wanted to talk to someone and kind of educate people, kind of shine a light on what's going on in California, what's been going on here for a while. And you were the first person that came to mind. I know you've been around for a while. Uh, you've been in the trenches of California hockey. I know because when I first started, one of the first places I walked in, you were there. So we've both been around for a minute. So I know you've been doing great work. So I, I was, uh, Really looking forward to having you on talking. Yeah, excited to be here. Excited to talk hockey and California hockey. And um, I have definitely been in the trenches right there with you for the last, you know, 11 years coaching and I don't know, 15 years before that playing. So um, excited, love talking hockey and excited to see uh, what you have in store for me here. Awesome, man. So the question I have gotten asked as a hockey guy in California a lot, I'm sure you have too. How do you get started you know, how do you, how does the game of hockey attract yeah, yeah. as a young California guy? Um, I was like five, six years old. My my older cousin was playing in Burbank and uh, they invited us out to a game. So yeah, sure, let's go. Had fun watching, but I wasn't like a gung-ho about it yet. And then my brother's like, I want to play hockey. And I, I said, if he's playing, I'm playing. He's old, my older brother, I'm like, if he's doing it, I'm going to do it. So I just kind of started playing just like that. Um, how old were you? Five, six. I mean, I started skating at five. My brother wanted. To, my brother was eight, right? So he's three years older than me, and he wanted to play. Like he wanted to get into sports and play. And I just was like, I'm along for the ride. So I was like, might as well. And then, you know, it kind of from there, I just got trapped, man. <laughs> you get you get sucked in in a good way, right? Like I, I got I got it hooked pretty quick. Started playing regularly. Got into house league and stuff. And then I think by the I think I was playing for fun for a while and then by the time I was like 13, 14, I kind of caught the bug. Like that's what it, that's when it kind of was like, I just want to play it all day. Mm -hmm. Just get me to the ring. That's all I want to do, so. And for you, I wanted to ask, cause my experience, you know, we're about the same age. So yeah, I probably yeah. saw kind of the same sort of thing coming up, but my experience coming up playing hockey in California, I had an absolute gong show as far as coaches. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It just, I kid you not, I, I had, a coach asked me what an icing was when I was young, uh, playing in Temple City at uh, roller hockey when I was probably about seven or something. Yeah. But just, I had pretty atrocious coaching coming up. Um, so was that at all your experience? Or I know you played at a higher level and you had some pretty good coaches later on, but yeah, in the I early mean, days, how was it? It was weird. I was so naive to the whole thing because I played house league. So like, I didn't know any better. I just wanted to play. There was a bunch of parents who took up hockey when their kids started playing, mm -hmm. right? So nobody really, nobody was out there teaching proper fundamentals or anything. They were learning as they went. So it wasn't, wasn't good. <laughs> it wasn't great. You know, we just went and skated, had fun and then, uh, I played house league till I was like 14 and then I started getting into travel and that's when you started getting a little bit better coaching. Uh, but even there, not gonna lie to you, some of it, some of it was great. I had some really good coaches, guys who had played, you know, major juniors and college and pro and then guys who just been around the game for a while and then you had some other guys who were just kind of dinosaurs and trying to coach what they knew 40 years ago and wasn't quite the same way. So um, kind of all over the board. Uh, but yeah, I mean, house league, when you get in the house league, it's usually, it's not the best coaching, right? It's just parents who are trying to help out or do something, get on the ice, make sure there's something. Because typically the guys who are experienced are usually already in travel, um, trying to work with more committed kids and not so beginners. So um, yeah, house league coaching was rough. <laughs> it wasn't great. And then as you kind of started playing at like the higher levels, um, you're coaching obviously, kind of elevated, right? You had some pretty good ones coming up. Yeah, for the most part. I mean, there's always, you know, uh, some, it was kind of a roller coaster, right? You get better coaches, but there's always gonna be a hiccup here or two where you, they just put somebody there who's not the best. But I mean, I had I had a few really good ones in youth hockey. Uh, one of them is Jocelyn Langloy, who's out in Carol North Carolina right now, I think. And then um, Peter Torson, who's a big, California hockey guy, right? So he's made a pretty good name for himself. I had him early on into his coaching career, so a couple years in, so I had him. No, this was at Panorama. So I had him when he was coaching at the West Valley Wolves. So before he got to the Bears, because he's kind of been through all the clubs too. So um, when he was a few years into coaching, I had him when I was like 15. So he was really good for me then. Um, I had Jocelyn right after, who was also really good for me. And 
taught the game a completely different way than Peter, but high energy, a lot of skill work, so that was great. Um, and then by the time I got to juniors, I ended up with uh, Billy McCult, who was an absolute legend. Yeah. I mean, he coaches in, um, I think, Northern Western Michigan right now. He was, uh, I think most recently, he was at University of Michigan. Yeah, he's at U of M now, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I gotta, I gotta double check on. Yeah, I mean, he was, I know he was at a different college and then went to Michigan because that's where he's played. Yeah, um, Obi Baker finalist. Yeah, yeah, he was, he was, he was a hell of a player. Yeah. I always see the video clip of him just bodying Gretzky. Oh yeah, yeah, he was kind <laughs> so, of a madman. Yeah, yeah, so he, he was, he was really good for me because he, he showed me the next level, like mm -hmm. one, all these coaches helped me out in a certain way, but he showed me kind of my identity as a player and like what I need to do to succeed and where my game was at and how to, how I can take that to the next level. And uh, he's just the guy you want to play for. So he was, he was, he was fun, fun coach, yeah. um, little cocky, which makes it even better, right? All the good yeah. coaches have a little arrogance yeah. to him. So it was great. Yeah. Uh, I had a great time with him. He was so. a good player. Uh, was this, were, were you playing for Bill McCall? Uh, during the WSHL? Yeah, so my first year of juniors, that's when Billy was there. So Billy left. I had one year with Bill, and then Bill went, moved on to coaching the NA after that. So my first year at the WSHL was with Billy. Yeah, so I know a lot of people, I, I forget whether it's the AHL or the ECHL, people refer to it as the jungle. Yeah. Um, for me, my jungle is the Western is States. The yeah, yeah, WSHL yeah. because it is the most fascinating hockey league. I mean, I don't know if it, is it even still? Yeah, no, I think it's the USPHL now it, mostly. It it's kind of enough. it's kind of all over the place, right? So like the WSHL has been through um, kind of a roller coaster of a league because it was Junior B, and then um, it was a smaller league, and then it became a Junior A Tier Three league and kind of expanded, mm -hmm. and then that's when I was playing in it, um, where you had a Western Division and a Midwest Division. Mm -hmm. And there was like an import rule of a couple imports per team. And then from there, uh, after I was out of the WSHL, uh, it expanded even more and started absorbing all these teams. It left USA Hockey. So it lost like its import rule where they, now they can add up to like eight, nine guys per team. So that's when it became kind of all over. Um, skill was getting better, but it was super watered down too because there's so many teams. Yeah. Um, and then it kind of got absorbed by the USPHL, I think. So it's it's been kind of all over, but it's a bit of the jungle. I mean, it's like you have your teams uh, that were really good, and then you had some teams that just had no business being there. And same, same with players. Too. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, that's that's how, right? Like, like it was. We were kind of in the middle. Like we were like when we were, when I was on the Flyers, we were kind of in the middle. They got pretty good after, but. Um, we were kind of just like right outside the playoffs for it, uh, but it was like top six on the teams, top nine were pretty good. Um, the fourth line can play a bit, and then you'd have a fifth and sixth line for some reason just sitting in the stands every game that had no business being there. Yeah. Uh, like, say hockey probably loves that. Yeah, I mean, they were just kind of like, you know, it's a pay to play league, right? So yeah. a lot of the organizations would just, yeah. and if somebody, you play 40 something games, three game weekends, kids get hurt. So they wanted reserves of people who can play. So like what would happen with us is, we had some guys who worked hard and were kind of there. Uh, a little out of the lineup, probably should have just been playing like 18 under or something and getting better. Would have probably been better for them, but they were you know, on our roster sitting in the stands for most of the time. So it's kind of rough for them, but yeah, it's it a little all over the place. But some, some studs coming out of that league too. Like there's guys who would, be really good, tear it up, jump up a league, or go, you know, college right out of it. Uh, and then there were guys who were just hanging on. Yeah. <laughs> hanging yeah. on for life. So. Yeah, and I, I say it's like my jungle because in a lot of the ways that the HRECHL gets called yeah. the jungle, it's because a lot of it is a lot of just tough, just monsters, but also really good skills. Yeah. And that was the WSHL for me was I would, you know, first of all, I was watching the WSHL yeah. because I was a scout for a team in the WHL. They wanted no business right. me watching the WSHL. Yeah. They would tell me not to, but I'd be hanging out at the rink and I couldn't help but stick yeah, around yeah. and watch the games because you have these kids from Sweden or Russia just flying Mutants, out yeah. there and absolutely skilled. Like, yeah. I would argue some of them elite, just very, very yeah, good players. Yeah. And then on the other end, you'd have some guys who were just like, 
out there just trucking people yeah. and just look like dragging their knuckles around yeah yeah, yeah absolutely yeah. so it was it was too fascinating for me not to watch and i i always tried to make a case for some of the wsl yeah, yeah, yeah. but they were a little bit older and whl just wanted nothing to do with no them. i can't see that jump <laughs> it's it's a big jump right and like typically the kids who are if you're in the WSHL, you're not usually a 16-year-old going to the WSHL. Yeah. Like, those guys are still trying to play AAA and then go somewhere else after. Um, typically, the WSHL would be like 18-year-olds starting coming in and no WHL team wants, wants to. But yeah, it was, you'd have guys, you know, there was, it was a tough, there, there was tough guys in the league, but I don't think it was like, I think it kind of got to it, but where everybody just fights every game. No, no, like teams would have a fighter. Well, you had almost. We had. Defense, right? I I scrapped a bit, but we had. Uh, we didn't really have a fighter, so that was kind of one of the reasons why I ended up fighting a bunch. Is I wasn't. I didn't fight before junior, so I wasn't going in as a fighter. I just kind of naturally took that. I mean, I played. I played a tough game. Played a mean game. I'm not a big guy, right? Five nine, so not like, not like going out there shaking my gloves at people and people are getting intimidated, but. Uh, I played a tougher game. I ran my mouth enough, so I had to kind of back it up a few times. Uh, I ended up, I ended up, you know, dropping one of the tougher guys uh, off a hit, and he just chased me around after that and had me fight. I held my own, so I kind of got a little extra confidence after that, right? Of like, well, if I can take this guy, I can kind of throw him with any of them. Sure. Um, and then the next game, Billy pulled me aside and was just kind of like. Hey, you're gonna start next game, and I want you to go right away. He goes, drop him and grab the first, grab that guy and just go. Him. Old school. Yeah, he's like, he's like, he looked at me, goes, that kid's a pretender. You're gonna fight him. You're gonna show it. I was like, all right, no problem. And I lined up with the guy. I lined up with the guy, and their coach pulled the guy off. So then Billy pulled me off. He goes, all right, good job. Kind of proved proved the point. But after that, I kind of like, I was like, all right, I can do this. Like, not that I want to just be a fighter, but if I need to fight. I'm no problems doing it. So I started protecting myself and teammates a little bit more and then the penalty started racking up. But it kept me in the lineup, right? I was a depth guy my first year, been making a jump to junior. So anything to kind of keep me, make a difference on the team and kind of keep me in the lineup kind of helped. So third, third, I played mostly third line that year, a little bit of fourth line, but if I had to fight, I had to fight. I had no problems with it. And uh, I fought some tough guys. So was, I did pretty well for myself. Yeah, nice. So are you are you originally from the valley? Yeah, grew up grew up in uh, Arlita, so like five minutes from the Panorama Rink, so right in that area. Oh yeah, right by the Vic. So, yeah, yeah. So grew up right by the Vic, um, played there for most of my life, and then uh, played in Valencia for a couple of years for juniors, and then went off to Massachusetts for college. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I wanted to kind of get your your thoughts on. And when talking about California hockey, yeah. uh, a lot of people do not know, but specifically Los Angeles area, like I started in Pasadena, then I was in Burbank, a uh, huge Armenian hockey yeah. playing population here. For a sure. lot of very good Armenian hockey players, which a lot of people, you know, wouldn't know. You know, I'm sure a lot of Armenian people wouldn't know. They have a lot of yeah, yeah. Uh, big hockey community here. Um, surprisingly, only one NHL, uh, one Armenian NHL player, Zach Bogosian. Yeah. Um, you would, you know, if you're, if you spend time in the California hockey scene, you'd be shocked to find that out. But yeah, just one Armenian NHL player. But I'm sure that's going to change. Yeah, I think there's a few kind of coming up. Uh, Aram Manetian, he's on, he's on uh, Boston College, I think. He's on the US NTDP team, and he's on the okay. World Junior yeah. team. He's, he's, nah, he's money. He's really good. So uh, I don't. I mean, he's, he has our. He seems like an, he has an Armenian name, seems like an Armenian back. I don't know the kid at all, but uh, obviously when I see Armenian names, I'm like, yep, yeah, pay yeah, attention sure. to that, that guy. Time with these yeah, guys yeah, pay attention to that guy. So uh, he's a player, so I'm sure he'll make it. Um, there's this goalie in the WHL, his name is Nick, I think Avakin. He's actually a local kid too, local. And he's he's got like the Armenian flag on his mask and stuff, so it's pretty cool. So I'm, I'm pulling for him, hopefully he makes it. Um, but yeah, I mean, a lot of, a lot of Armenians in LA, right? So uh, because of that, you have a bigger Armenian hockey community here, and it's kind of funny. Community small, so like everybody knows everybody. Mm -hmm. So people will come up to me like, "Hey, you know this guy? He plays hockey." I'm like, "Yeah, probably. Yeah, like, I'm yeah, sure I've sure. seen him at some point." Um, you know, we had for a while. We uh, a bunch of us were in on the Armenian national team and kind of played a few tournaments for the team. So we were kind of in the mix of the hockey Armenian community. So we, we got to know a lot of the other guys that way. 
Uh, so it's cool to see. I love seeing it grow. Um, I have a kid I used to coach, actually. His name's Lucas Fong. He started like a um, an hockey foundation for helping Armenian hockey grow. So it's really cool. He just kind of kicked it off. So kind of quick little shout out to him. But uh, he's like helping facilitate like gear and all this stuff and program um, and get some financial support to kind of grow the game in Armenia. So it's good. So, oh, wow. so really cool for him. Wow. So actually in Armenia, not like he's Armenian here. American. No, no, he's here, but he's trying to help grow the game in Armenia itself. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's cool. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So it's good to see that. Good to see him give back. So right now, what is your position currently in hockey? So uh, I am currently the head of player development for the SC Flyers. So I've been coaching youth hockey for the past 10 years. I think it's my 11th season um, going in. So I graduated in 2013. And then right away kind of came back and started working with kids and coaching. So um, basically my role is I oversee our A and B um, development program. So as a club right in California, uh, there's there's tier, there's tier one, tier two, and then there's A and B hockey. So I kind of oversee the A and B program. We have, I believe, eight A and B teams right now. So we got the two mites, two, three 10 U's. 212 years, so that's seven, and then well, 14 years. Yeah, so we got 18 right now. So I kind of oversee um, those groups, oversee the development, make sure that kind of uh, the coaches have all the support they need, the players are on the right track and developing and getting better and competing. And, you know, if there's any anywhere I can kind of jump in and help each team or parents or parents have any um, things they want to bring up to me, I kind of jump in and help out that way. Well, I can vouch for you personally. I think you do yeah. an amazing job of that. Uh, it's one of the reasons why you were the first person who came to mind when I wanted to talk about some California hockey. So, um, yeah, outstanding job there. So what would you say your philosophies are as far as player development? It's kind of like the million dollar question in hockey. Yeah. Everyone thinks they're a player developer. Everyone thinks they're a coach that could develop NHL players. Right, right. What's kind of your, your big like core tenets, your key philosophies on that? Well, it's, you know, I guess it's, it's a couple things, right? If I'm, when I'm coaching a team versus doing a skill session, it's a little bit different. Uh, as far as coaching a team and kids and getting all that involved, uh, you know, I want, want the kids to show up to the rink and leave having fun, right? They, I want them to enjoy coming to the rink. So that's number one. We're, we're working with, you know, for the most part, 10, 11, 12 year olds, 13 year olds. Uh, and we're working with the point zero, you know, 0.01% make it, right? Like that, like make it 0.01%. We're working with a 99.99% of the rest of the kids, right? So uh, number one is want to make sure they're having a good time when they come to the rink. They want to be there. They're not forced to be there. They actually enjoy, they leave practice, they had a good time. So that's first and foremost. Um, number two is making these kids want to learn how to be on a team, right? Being teammates. And then their work ethic, right? Making sure they're showing up to the rink and they're ready to compete. So those three things are kind of like the baseline of what we look for these kids. Because at the end of the day, it's all about the life skills that come from from youth hockey, for the most part, right? These kids, like we said, it'd be great if they could turn it into a college education. If they can extend it as long as they can, great. Um, but I do, you know, all these kids are going to be out in the real world at some point. So trying to develop that foundation for them where they can build off of them, build their life skills is one. Um, and then from there, you start teaching the game as much as possible. But it's all about age specific, skill specific, right? At certain levels, you're going to do a lot more skill drills and development where they get their puck touches and, and learn how to skate and properly get to move their feet. Because if they can't get to the puck, if they don't have confidence to make a play with the puck, you can't really teach the elaborate stuff as far as systems mm -hmm. or any of that. So um, really systems is secondary to me. It's all about individual development within the team structure first. Mm -hmm. um, and then from there, as you get to the higher levels, yes, implement the systems. But we want to be able to have kids who can think on their own and play within any system versus this is all you're allowed to do and they become very robotic and then they get a new coach. And they're like, I don't understand how to play this way because my other coach, like you'll get a coach who's very systematic as far as dump and chase or any of that and find you can fit into that system. And then you get a coach who wants to stretch the ice out and make these long rush plays mm -hmm. and uh, look for that guy flying. And you get a coach like that and you're like, I, all I've been taught is throw the puck in deep. I don't know what I'm doing yeah. here. So yeah. you want to make sure you build hockey players that can play in multiple systems and not just 
This is the system that's all you're allowed to play. Um, so taking that roboticness away from them, trying to get them to think, but have the ability to make those decisions. So really develop their skills to get there. Um, and as far as skill sessions and stuff, you know, you see so many coaches now just posting um, and becoming skilled coaches, which is great. I mean, it's it's good as long as you market it the right way, like you're there to help them. You're, you're not providing, you know, to go to this guy and you're gonna be in the NHL. That's not kind of how it works, right? Um, when I do the skill sessions, I work with all different groups, right? I have I have beginners, like in-house kids, and I have AB kids, and I have tier kids who come out to me, and then even in the summers, I'll have kids who are still in juniors in college who want to come skate. And it's, for the most part, it's just fundamentals, right? Focusing on the fundamentals, even with the higher level kids. Um, a lot of skating, a lot of puck touches. Um, I do a lot of shooting drills with them and just kind of fine tuning their shooting. It's kind of one of the things I try to focus on a little bit more just because I'm more comfortable with it, right? Um, so that's kind of where my some of my strengths were. So I try to really, with the higher level skill players, kind of teach the proper mechanics of their shot and how to get their body into it and how to kind of get the most snap out of it in their quick release. Um, but it's all it's all age and skill relative, right? When I work with nine, ten year olds, I'm not really focusing on it's it's the, yeah, it's just the fundamental mechanics of like shooting and then the skating and, and kind of getting there from there. And as they get better, you just kind of add to it and, and progress. So once they get one level down, they start cheating a little bit. It means they kind of got it down. You kind of add the progression to it and kind of go from there. Mm -hmm. So one of the things um, I wanted to ask about. I personally feel like USA Hockey is a little bit asleep at the wheel in this regard. Uh, I know they make an effort, but it's yeah. not nearly good enough. Uh, parent education on having like young athlete, young hockey yeah. players, how to properly be a hockey parent. Yeah, they can use quite a few classes, right? But I feel like, I mean, I think there should be something where we can, we can feed them more information. Uh, similar to like coaching seminars that they do right totally um they can kind of i think it'd be super helpful to have some sort of virtual seminar for parents interested in kind of learning mm -hmm. uh, about it but at the end of the day those parents you know there's gonna be parents who are not gonna care what anybody else has to say and how, how they should be parents they're gonna think they have the right mindset no matter what but for the ones who are actually interested in learning and and, and understanding a little bit more i think it'd be very helpful which is 99 percent yeah of them, you know yeah. 99 percent of hockey parents are amazing uh, yeah yeah there's agreed. always that very one much. percent though very much agreed. that you know and you feel bad for them too it's just like it, most of them don't mean no it's, it's well they intentioned just, but they just yeah they just don't they weren't given that education or that information like right. hey you know if your kid has a bad game they don't want to hear about it on the two-hour right. drive back right. home you know or on the way to the rink you know they don't want to coach for sure at home you know so it's just you know you can't completely fault them but it is something that unfortunately we see it all the time it, it impacts a lot oh, of the yeah. kids and in and, and the negative you know a lot of kids don't want to play or it's just too much pressure and it's like dude you're 12 you should be having fun yeah. out there so you know it's understandable but it, it you know it's something i would like to see you know a little bit more uh force yeah, power I, going I, toward a i agree i mean like the car rides home like take kids out of the sport you mm -hmm. know what i mean like kids when they, they start and then they start gripping their sticks too tight and they don't want to play mm -hmm. they just scared to make a mistake after and then you know they go because they know they're gonna go back in and just get ripped apart in the car ride so it sucks yeah. Um, it's difficult for them. It makes it hard. It makes it harder for them to want to come to the rink more, right? So, yeah. I mean, anything we can do to kind of help. I think as coaches, we try to lay the foundation for them when we talk to the parents before. Um, just go, hey, like one thing I always tell the parents is like, they're not their coach or their cheerleader, right? Like, be a parent, be a cheerleader. Um, you're there to pump your kid up. You're there to kind of be proud of them and support them. 100%. You're not there to criticize and be like, and you know, you're not there to. Um, I guess like take accountability away from them either, but you're not there to just put them down, right? It's, it's all about building them up and and even as coaches, our job is to build them up. So we don't want to build them up for the most part, send them back in the car and then they get torn down after too. So um, the more parents can realize they should just, if they can remove themselves just a step and get that emotional attachment out of, not their kid, but their emotional attachment out of their kid's performance is an indication of who they are as a parent, then they can kind of relax a little bit and be like, 
all right, I'm just proud of my kids out there working hard versus yeah. this is what you did wrong, this is what you did wrong, right? Your, your kid's performance on the ice is not a reflection of who you are as a parent. Mm -hmm. Your kid's ability to uh, listen to their coach, your kid's ability to work hard, your kid's ability to be respectful, that's a reflection of your parenting, not, not their abilities on the ice. So the more they can understand that part of it, and if they can promote that versus everything has to be perfect, I think it'll be a little bit easier for their kids and the parents too, because, I mean, they're living and dying by their kids' games, and you're like, yeah, you know, sometimes the kids playing cross ice hockey at yeah. eight. You like it's it'll be okay. Like, you know, be, glass, yeah, yeah, it'll be all right. Like yeah. you don't have to yell at the thirteen year old ref who missed the call. Like it'll okay. be, it'll it'll be yeah, okay. <laughs> it'll be okay. So, as far as players, I know a lot of times players have questions and they're really curious about what levels to play at. Like kind of how to navigate through. You know, do I want to get you know less puck touches playing triple A or do I want to get right. more? Puck touch is playing double A, like what are the pros and cons and just like how would you say to navigate that? Yeah, I mean, I think ideally whatever level you're playing, you're actually playing and you're not sitting on the bench, right? Like you actually need to be, if you're going to be on a team, it makes more sense to be on a team that you're actually going to get your reps in during a game where you can actually worry about making decisions and, and that way you can develop. Um, I wouldn't, see like one of my things, I don't get... I don't like focusing on the level of hockey for the most part. Everybody's got their own path. Um, I wouldn't get caught up in playing tier one, tier two, A, B, it doesn't matter. At eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, like nobody's elite, nobody's this, nobody's that, right? You just play at the right level and continue to progress. If that right level is A for you, then play at A so you can actually get better and challenge yourself and push yourself to get the right touches, get the coaching, and then push yourself to try to get to the next level. And once you kind of, if you're hanging on in A by a thread, you shouldn't be looking to jump to double A, right? If you're if you're dominating A and you're looking, yeah, I understand, make the jump to the next level because you'll fit in properly. But it's um, overall that the levels to me, I think there's a, too much focus on it growing up and there's too much of kids and parents worrying so much about where their kid's gonna be in a year or two years or three years and getting down the line, my kid needs to play double A by Pee Wee so that he's triple A by this year, so that by 13, 14, 15, he's getting scouted by the WHL. Like, none of that stuff matters. I'm telling you right now, it does not matter. Uh, if your kid's ready for the right levels, he will get there and he will get looked at eventually. Right, as long as they progress. But what you want is to make sure they're coming to the rink, they're enjoying themselves, they're playing, they're getting better. And as long as that happens, everything will take care of itself because there's so many stories across the NHL. There's so many examples, not even NHL, just college hockey, all of that. There's so many examples where kids just develop later. You can be the best kid at 10, it does not mean you're gonna be the best kid at 17, mm -hmm. right? So playing at the highest levels at 10, 11, 12 doesn't mean anything. Just make sure you're developing the right way and loving the game and playing as long as you can and everything else will kind of fit into place. Um, I, know, I, I know there's a handful of examples, just NHL players or guys who just didn't even play tier hockey. Mm -hmm. Tanner Pearson comes to mind. Right. Uh, Dustin Penner, I believe, was also like a junior B player and was not... Uh, yep didn't make the major junior and kind of patty maroon i mean like those guys were all guys who and then there's a story about david perron um i was told and he he got scouted at a beer league game like he was playing triple a and wow. stuff didn't make certain junior team so he just went back and was playing adult league hockey and was just tearing it up and somebody saw him playing like get this wow. kid somewhere so like uh so like it, it doesn't you know what i mean like it, it, it Getting ahead of ourselves doesn't help anybody, and I think it just adds way too much pressure and stress for everybody. Uh, you know, personally, like, I played house league until I was 14. Like, you know what I mean? Like, at that point, right now, if you tell somebody they played house league until they were 14, they're like, why are you even still playing house? You know what I mean? Like, what, are you, yeah. what aspirations do you have at that point? Because yeah. if you're not playing tier or whatever by 12, you're already out of the game. Yeah. And not that I went on to play the crazy levels, but I got to play some NCAA hockey, and you know, you just take it step by step, and. I was so naive to the, I, if somebody told me, I wouldn't have known because I was so naive to the whole process. I just wanted to play, right? And that's kind of the best advice I can give some of these guys. It's good to be prepared and know what different outcomes could be and what paths there should be, but like, to set these unrealistic expectations of my kid needs to play this, then this, then this, otherwise it's all over. Mm -hmm. I'll just tell you, it doesn't matter. I know plenty of kids who were superstars 
at 14, 15, and they got burned out because were, they were doing this to them. They just threw the bag away and never looked at it again. Mm -hmm. right? Like kids in, playing in the WHL at 16 years old, almost a point per game as a rookie, mm -hmm. and he comes back, puts the bag away, and says, I don't play hockey anymore. Mm -hmm. It's like, would you rather have that, or would you just rather have somebody who loves the game and plays long enough, right? So. Yeah. Yeah. At the end of the day, every league leads to beer league. We just want to play hockey, man. You just want to love the game and play hockey. Yeah. So, yeah. Unfortunately, like as far as what you were saying, there's a unfortunately a lot of uh, kind of like hierarchy chasing, uh, yeah. the letter chasing. You know, parents or kids see AAA and that they think that's where they need to be. Yep. It's like an inherent thing with all of them. You know, even if it's a kid who who's been playing for three months. They yeah. see AAA and think that's where they need yeah. to be or sometimes that's where they deserve to be. Right. And a, a lot of problems, you know, float downstream from that kind of way of thinking because it's completely not true. Yeah, there's this new, I think it's like a new five, like last five years, maybe a little bit longer, but there's like an epidemic, I'd call it, of just elite hockey everywhere. And everybody oh, yeah. wants to, every, elite, everybody wants to be invitation. elite. Yeah, yeah, everybody wants to be elite. Everybody wants to be selected in the special invite and mm -hmm. this. And if you're not elite, then it's like, why bother? And it's just yeah. like, you're 11, you're not elite. I'm telling you right now, you're, yeah. you're, you're not elite. You're 11 years old. Mm -hmm. Like just play hockey, get better. Play at the highest levels you can, sure, but don't get caught up in the levels, don't get caught up in any of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, have fun, you know, take it slow, don't rush yourself. Yeah. Touch the puck, obviously, but yeah. All right, Simbot, thanks so much, man. Yeah, I really pleasure. appreciate you doing this. Uh, thanks for shining a light on a lot of things. I think it's gonna be super useful information for parents, players, you know, and anyone kind of wondering about what's going on in California hockey, so thanks, man. Yeah, thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. Bye.